Deep and I met uh, three or four years ago. He spoke uh, a couple years back at this group. I've interacted with him a number of times on the business front. And as a venture capitalist and somebody who's been involved with helping companies grow for over 20 years, uh, the concept of pricing gets undervalued. And you're talking about marketing and people and finance and all these things. And from my perspective, it just seems like a lot of folks uh, miss high. Uh, not very good connection with their pricing and the value proposition, or they go the other way and they think they're going to capture market share and they go low and then they don't have enough profits to build a business. And so I think that this is a fascinating uh, topic. I think that it will add a lot of value to what you're doing with your business. And with that, I want to call up Navdeep. As Rich Rick was mentioning, this is my second time here. The first time I came, it was a related topic and it was about how do you price your innovation, which was about uh, when you come up with a brand new product or a concept, how do you extract value out of it? Today, it's a related topic, but we're going to focus on preparedness. That, you know, for me, um, innovation and disruption are sometimes the flip side of the same coin. That when you're out leading in the marketplace with innovation, sometimes you're causing disruption for others, which is good for you, but heaven forbid, what happens if you're faced with disruption? And a lot of times, companies, when they're faced with such uh, circumstances, they react. So what I want to talk about is that preparedness. Uh, so let me quickly tell you where I come from. What is my background? Uh, I've been involved in price excellence in many, many different industries. I started my career in the airlines, went to medical device, uh, with Medtronic, went to a manufacturing company, and then after that I've been in several companies uh, as a uh, consultant and as a practitioner. And things used to be much easier when I was an analyst, when I started my career. But as I became a manager, a director, a VP, I had to convince people. So I had my successes in pricing, but I got awards. Uh, but also I found that it, sometimes it got really frustrating that I thought I had good ideas, but then I had to go convince people. And then I started writing a bit um, to test my own ideas. Got lucky, got an article, uh, a co-authored article published in Harvard Business Review, which got me a book deal. Uh, that book got translated in Chinese a couple of years ago, so I went to teach in China. And uh, the article that I wrote was then um, HBR did a compilation of seven articles. There's a book called Harvard Business Review on Pricing. And they took articles on pricing from the Second World War. Since that time, they chose seven of those from those articles, and mine is one of them. And since then, I've been uh, very fortunate that I've been invited to submit book chapters. So one of the books where I submitted book chapters, Oxford University Press did a book. It's a handbook of pricing. Etc. So now I spend most of my time consulting and some of my time in teaching. So I want to build our discussion today on three major topics. One is that we need to recognize that change is inevitable. I want to spend a lot of time showing that change will come. And the change may come from inside the company or from outside. It may come in good times or bad. So we need to recognize it will come, and we have to be prepared for that. Uh, second, we should look at pricing as a number. Price is not just a number. There's a lot involved in that. It takes strategy. How do you position your product in the marketplace? What is the value you provide? How do you differentiate yourself? It's also so much about execution. It takes negotiation. It takes negotiating contracts, compliance, reporting. Um, all the way up to customer satisfaction. So there could be so many issues around pricing. And if many of you are business owners, you'll see that you're facing one aspect or the other of that pricing. So we need to, when you go out solve problems around those issues, it's better not to look at just the number and say, I'm going to reduce my price or I'm going to raise my price. Look at where the problem is coming from. So in a way, rather than looking at pricing as a ball of twine, and disentangle that ball of twine and separately look at the issues where the problem is. It's easier to solve problems that way. 
And finally, want to go into what do we do about it when, when major change comes? Are we going to be prepared? So I'm going to talk about four foundational steps, and I'm going to show some examples from my work. But you may have other things going on. So you may see. So I'm going to talk about those four steps. And I would not try to paraphrase what Machiavelli said, but I'll try again. It's look before you leap. When you start big initiatives around pricing, um, so I'll let you read it for a second. So without further ado, um, in good times, companies feel optimistic. The market wants them to grow and show growth. And so they embark on big strategic actions, typically. And sometimes it's about when they're looking for growth, they're also looking for efficiencies, cost reduction. So they m and if you look around in the Twin Cities area, big companies, a lot of m and consolidation activity. They want to be close to their customer. They want to have super smart systems. So they bring in technology. Uh, and because they are gearing for growth, they sometimes reorganize inside place people in different places, fire people, hire new people. And of course, when they're looking at investments, they say, OK, we're going to cut costs in some areas and put money in other places. Now, when these things happen, it's like you're moving the cogs in your machine. And if the cogs don't fit, if you're changing one thing, but you're not changing the entire system around it, things don't fit very well. And I've been in companies when big initiatives happen, you got a t-shirt. You were part of the yellow team or the blue team or the green team. But sometimes these teams were not coordinated. So everybody decided to do things as they knew how. And either it, you ran into delays or the projects didn't work out. So this is something we need to avoid. And although we are in kind of out of recession, we're out of recession, let's say that, right? But companies still face uh, challenges both internally and externally. So um, we see that the markets have really not awakened. We don't see that vitality yet in many markets. Markets are stagnant. The customers are still cautious. They're buying. And when they buy, they're very uh, aggressive in negotiating. They are prof professional procurement people who do the, that work for them. And competitors as they were in the recessionary environment, they're still very aggressive in terms of trying to get more market share. And every day we look at the business section of the newspaper, did the Fed increase the interest rates? So yes, we are expecting cost inflation, but uh, we are still holding off. Can we take price increases yet or not? And I'll take a slight detour. I mean, I worked with some of you. Um, that if you are in a situation where your company needs to take a price increase, don't wait too long. Don't expect the inflation will come, then you will start taking some actions. One example in the marketplace, very visible example, is uh, FedEx and UPS. Both these companies, uh, if you look at the gas prices, you would th think, why are they taking price increases? But FedEx took a price increase, which is effective. January 16th, 4.9%. They took the same increase last year at the same time. And they are timing it such that it's past the peak holiday season. Uh, and they're telling customers, we are doing this because we're expecting inflation. Uh, and so I was mentioning the challenges are not only externally, but also internally. Inside the company, some folks may be sitting on excess capacity. When that happens, people get very scared. They say, OK, let me cut costs. Let me restructure. I'm going to do a lot of things to make up for that inventory cost that I have. And there's, of course, this pressure to protect sales and market share. But in some environments, I also see companies that have, had, have been very successful in the past, people become complacent. I'll tell you an example. About 10 years ago, I worked for a company I went to. I was sent to China. I was a new director at a company. And uh, the Chinese market was booming, but the margins were kind of low. So I went, and the first thing, the, the country manager took me aside. Although I was there to sort of be the hawk, he took me aside and tried to browbeat me and say, look here, you know, we've got our strategy set. 
We just need more flexibility because it takes a long time to make pricing decisions for our customers and customers are fed up. So I said, would you give me a day rather than just give you an answer now? So I went and sat with some people on the side, um, a finance person, a salesperson, marketing person. Turns out they had some changes in where people sat. So the pricing team used to sit on the second floor, was sent up to sit on the fourth floor. And at that time, 70% of the orders still came by fax. And guess who picked up the fax? This is China, it's not in the US, wish we had the same thing, that there was a coffee person who would bring coffee to everybody's desk, coffee or tea, at 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. She picked up the faxes and brought it to the fourth floor. So if you miss that entire time from 10 to 4, the faxes are not coming to the pricing group. It moves to the next day. Customers are fed up. They start threatening. What do they do? They reduce price. So when we brought that up in the meeting, after I learned about this, uh, the problem was fixed in 20 minutes. They moved the fax upstairs. Uh, <laughs> so a lot of pricing problems are about something like housekeeping. Uh, so what do managers do when we have challenges? Our first thing is, I want to keep my customer, I'll reduce price. And just to show you some examples, right now the dollar is very strong, it's very fortunate, we can buy more from other countries, but unfortunately also we can sell less to other countries. Look at companies like PNG, and uh, this is happening at a time when uh, the Chinese currency has been devalued this year alone, six times. Uh, look at 15 years ago, our U.S. companies were rushing to China, set up operations there. China was also considered the big growth market and also uh, 1.25, 1.3 million consumers. Uh, three, four years ago, we started to see that China is no longer very viable. Things are very expensive now to produce there. And now, we still thought, yeah, this is great because we have consumers there. At least it's a big market for us. And now the market has slowed down. So that's a challenge. Oil, four years ago, it was $4 plus at the tank, at the gas station. Now we are about half that. There was a problem then. How do we pay, take price increases? Because even though shipping was expensive, now gas prices are low. Customers ask, why would you take a price increase when your shipping costs are low? Steel. U.S. industry has not done anything wrong, but China built this gargantuan <coughs> steel industry and their state is supporting it. So China is going around the world and dumping steel at very low prices, which is killing the US industry, and also the auto industry, because there's push for uh, more fuel efficient cars. Uh, they're using more aluminum than steel. So that is bringing steel prices down. And then it's not just what's happening in the environment. When companies themselves take actions, Bank of America bought countryside. It was not a happy marriage. They, they lost a lot of money. Daimler-Benz bought Chrysler to get access to the US market and, and probably the wor world market. If they had asked me, I would have said, don't do it. Uh, but it was not a good match. They had to actually give up money to, to sever ties with uh, Chrysler. And two glaring companies, I would have used examples from our Minneapolis uh, set, but I would lose friends if I did that. Uh, companies try to buy super smart systems. They uh, spend hundreds of millions of dollars. And if you look around our big companies in the Twin Cities, everybody is doing a SAP or Oracle deployment. But sometimes when these companies don't really figure it out how to do it best, things can go wrong. So you can read Noah's Kisses for Hershey's. Um, and then some things which I thought were somewhat positive, JC Penney, decided rather than have a promotion every day, I mean, in a way, rather than have a promotion uh, every day, let's just go and offer a permanently reduced price. But they didn't realize that customers won't like that, although they had a strong CEO, but it didn't work for them to their detriment. And uh, here's another company, Turing, and you've been probably looking at a company called Valiant. Uh, just pure greed. They bought smaller companies and decided to jack up the prices sky high because they thought that's an opportunity. What that did was it has brought scrutiny to the entire pharmaceutical industry. And so on and so on because there are in the retail segment, Target, Walmart, 
Best Buy, everybody is competing for the same customers. How do they do it best? That still remains the question. So I'm not saying that these companies were not smart. They had long range plans and everything in place, but they just could not anticipate the drastic change that was coming. So even our revered company, which some, uh, one company I really like in the Twin Cities is Target. And look how many people they had to lay off this year. So yes, one could blame the external environment, but let's look inside. When I go to meet clients and I'm talking to the senior leadership, <coughs> The conversation starts with this, that our competition is pretty irrational. They take these really strong pricing actions, or our channels are not working very well together, or our customers, they ask so much from us, but then they, they keep negotiating. So what do we do? We try to do everything they ask. And when you sit, sit with the teams to ask what's off, then it's a cathartic experience. People start to talk. Oh, you know what? There is, it takes too much time to make decisions. There are too many hands off, hands off. And our process is too manual. Our process has not changed for 30 years, although the market has. And as you start doing this, you see even, even established large companies, people are not doing <coughs> simple analysis. And somebody comes in and whispers in the lunch meeting, oh, our salespeople are the ones that are the problem. And, and you have to blame somebody, right? So if you don't prepare your salespeople with the right pitch, with the right value message, that's what's going to happen. So what, what, what is going on? There is this, I don't know who wrote this. Somebody says the customer is always right. Yes, the customer is who pays the bills. But if the customer asks us for a lower price, more terms, better product, we rush to go and submit and say, Mr. Customer, please, we've got everything. But there's a difference between customer responsiveness and customer focus. Responsiveness is good, but not at your own detriment. You need to have the customer focus where it's about providing the customer the right value, but also to have a framework that you can also extract the right price for that, that, that uh, value you're giving to the customer. Uh, there's continuous change, we talk about that, as I said, if you change one thing, you may have to change other things around it to not just leave one cog bigger or smaller and then not have your machine work efficiently. And management by gut feel, I won't even speak about it. Everybody knows we make kind of big swag decisions sometimes. Um, and what all this leads to is emotion. People you work with, you don't like them because they're not listening to you, they're working differently. And can you imagine people who you spend more time with than you spend with your spouse, and they're not happy with you and you're not happy with them? Uh, how can such people work in a team and produce a good product? And here we are talking about how do you produce a great product if you're going to be innovating? So uh, with that in mind, so I just wanted to establish with these slides is change will come. And we need to be prepared. Other thing, actually, even before the conversation started, a uh, gentleman, I was talking to Nathan, he was saying, you know, strategy and <coughs> operations, how do we really define them separately? So let's, just for the sake of a conversation maybe today, pricing strategy, or strat pricing strategy follows business strategy. And it's something that's more market facing. Whereas operations are typically what's happening inside the company. Um, and to just uh, sort of quickly define them uh, is focus of pricing strategy is market facing. Typically it needs to be long term to be effective. Um, and and the People who start that conversation on strategies typically comes from the boardroom and the C-suite because it follows business strategy. And it's usually three-year plans, five-year plans to be reviewed every year, sometimes every quarter. And the example is how are we going to position our product in the marketplace? Are we going to skim? Are we going to be a, or a low price player? Whereas pricing operation is more internally focused 
and we are thinking about, oh, there's something happening. Now do I tweak my pricing guidelines to my internal sales team? How do I go about doing that? So um, uh, here's the one quote I really like from Sun Tzu. He was a war strategist probably 2,000 years ago. He said a strategy is about doing things right and tax tactics are about doing the right things. Or did I say it the other way? But you get the gist. Uh, so let me take you through some examples. And I'm going to, I chose three examples where I was involved of three companies in three very different economic conditions. What was happening there? So one was an air conditioning company. Um, and this is the time uh, before the recession. Market was booming. This company was growing in big ways, um, but China had just started industrializing and they were buying all the steel and copper in the world. So they happened in the fall quarter. Suddenly there was 150 to 100 to 150% increase in the price of steel and copper. So this was not the time where companies say, I'm gonna shut my plant or lay off people. This is a booming economy. They had to take a price increase, never had the culture to do that. And the salespeople, they had a huge, organization, sales organization, incentivized purely on commission. And they were very afraid. They said, any change you do will, will destroy our market. So it, it really needed that they be convinced and go optimistically and do the work. So it came about, had to do the analysis to show that there was inconsistent pricing and that needed to be fixed first. And with that, could also show them their, that their own incentives, <laughs> their commission would not be affected. If it's affected, it would be only that it goes up. It was a big coup. Company was very successful. Before the action started, the CEO had been on the conference call. The share price had gone down $3, $3 because he said on a base of $42 or or so, because he told the market, we don't know how to take price increases. We can't do anything about it. And this was one action which got about $10 million within six, seven months for a $250 million division, one product line. That gave the confidence to a CEO of a multi-billion dollar company to say, yes, we know how to do it. Um, a tooling company, again, similar situation. This is just at the beginning of the recession, although we didn't know that the recession was coming. The key raw material, which was 60% of the, the production cost, went up 350 to 500%. Again, and this was an environment which was, they had multiple channels. Uh, just US alone had five to 600 salespeople. Um, IT systems, which were sort of messy because they had over time gotten out of whack a little bit. But the coup came, the, the success came from when people understood what they needed to do. So we developed pay playbooks sat with the salespeople and said, we have to take this big change. We have to take a big price increase. How would you go and talk to your customers and what, what would you hear from them? So people said, oh, here's the laundry list of problems they'll have. So we developed a playbook, working with the salespeople. What, what it did was, everywhere in the world, the salespeople had a very consistent message. Same message, almost to a script, and that, kept, even when customers talked to each other, they were convinced that this was the right move. And they needed the company as much as the company needed them. So it, it was a superior collaboration with the sales force. And this was a very recent company, just a few months ago, an ice cream company. They had been losing sales and market share in, in supermarket chains. And uh, they started, they convinced themselves that was all happening because people are getting more health conscious, People's tastes are changing. Uh, and what they said makes sense from, if you look at, from the US overall ice cream trends. But then when, when you ask the question, why is Ben and Jerry's growing? And our local, uh, in Twin Cities, we have Talenti. They're growing 200 to 300% a year. How is that happening? And you guys are not doing very well. You're number three, four, five company in the, in the country. It turned out the packet sizes they had uh, were not fitting to what, what they needed to do because supermarket chains look at ice cream, something that brings food traffic. And when they, 
And this company, they wanted to ship out more ice cream in two gallon tubs. So they were not shipping out the pint sizes because when I looked at the data, what was turning was the pints were selling very well, but they were not selling a whole lot of them, but there was growth. So then now they're trying to redo their plants into more pints and smaller size, um, this thing. So now all these companies, they're smart companies. They had strategic plans in place. It's not that they were uh, remiss there, but the success here was rooted in how people work together, how they could work their processes, and, um, and doing their analysis inside the company. So what happened here from that, I can draw out, draw out uh, is that we can, any company can develop some ongoing preparatory steps when you are going into a big initiative, whether it's the train is coming to you or you're going to the train. Uh, what, what are some of the things you could do? So first is uh, an assessment, and I'm talking about two to four weeks. I'm not talking about uh, long enterprise-wide projects where you know, you're dedicating three years to do a project. Quickly looking at what are the internal pricing capabilities, what are the roles, and, and what are the perception gaps uh, so people understand each other. And I'm gonna show examples of this. And then looking at doing an analysis, analysis not just with data, but let's look at your own processes. How does communication flow within the company between people, between computers, all the way to the customer? Um, and by just doing those two steps, you start to figure out what, where are the gaps, where have been missing things. And then uh, doing this, and I've been to a company last year which was figuring out why their contract process was uh, so convoluted, it had become so disorganized and complex. Uh, and when we talked to people, just around the table in 20, 30 minutes, we had 60 issues on whiteboards. And so, Yes, you can do all those things, but how do you recommend, uh, how do you prioritize which things are we going to fix first? So we're gonna talk about that. And then it's not just leaving a recommendation, it's about then how do you get people to work together? So unless there's a shared understanding of how to fix things, people will not be able to do it very well. So it's training uh, of not just what, what, what are the recommendations, why the recommendations are there, what the recommendations are, and what benefit would you get out of it. And then it's possible to implement with greater certainty. So if you follow these steps, whether you're trying to improve the top line or the bottom line, or you have issues like when you're trying to resolve interchannel issues, or you're looking at the balance scorecard, going all the way, you can fix a lot of things by doing just some internal um, house cleaning. And this is one way to uh, preempt any unnecessary risks. And, and also it gives a chance for us to identify the priorities and then be able to, to allocate resources accordingly. And then just for the sake of harmony and people working happily, if people know what they're doing and why they're doing it, it just makes a lot of um, uh, difference. So let me go through uh, a few slides just to show you examples. I mentioned before that price is just not a number, right? There's so much going on. Even in a small or mid-sized companies, you will have so, uh, oops, so many uh, aspects of pricing. There's somebody sets up the standard list price, uh, promotions, there's communication to customers. There may be multiple brands. You might have global or even regional contracts. Scorecards, so, so many aspects of pricing. And there are so many people, almost everybody in the company is involved in pricing decisions. So just wanted to give you a view of this. And then when I go to companies, I've done this six, seven times in companies, and it's uh, quite a, a nice exercise and very well, nice way to get to know a company. So you go to people, it's a small survey-based exercise. Ask the people, you know, what are the top key activities around pricing? Uh, so like, you know, we take price increases, we are launching new products, we are negotiating contracts, et cetera. And then what are the key steps involved in each of these uh, key activities? And by the way, who's involved? So asking the question, what are the key activities? Who's involved? And by the way, what's your level of satisfaction in it? 
and if you have any comments. So this is one view. Uh, I deliberately tried to make it so you can't see it very clearly, but I'll show you what it is. These are the activities, uh, because I don't want you to recognize the company. These are the activities. So the black line is the activities. So this was competitive intelligence. This was um, contract management. And these are the stakeholders inside the company who are involved. So the idea is, what's your role in it, is was to ask people, each line should have at least one block, one blue block to show that somebody is manning that process. And you see these two huge areas which are completely blank. It's nobody's direct job in this company to manage competitive intelligence. So what happens? When we ask what are your satisfaction with the, when you ask for a scale of one to five, you start to see interesting things. First of all, customer service in this company is very unhappy. Everything is low scores. Uh, the, they are the tight most, uh, uh, call it a circle. Everybody says competitive intelligence, we are not good at it. But then when you look at discounts and concessions here, salespeople say we are really happy with it. Because there's flexibility, they need the flexibility. But at the same time, all everybody else, pricing, product managers, who say they own the product, there's a huge gap. So now we start to see there are gaps. So these people are not on the same page. I'm not saying one is good or bad, it's, it's they're not on the same page. And then when we start to the next step, which is sort of doing the analysis, one way is to sort of, let's take a little look in the rear view and see, <laughs> Uh, this was a situation where, where a company had recently launched a, a product. This was when Apple III was coming, and this was an a electronic connector which made, helped make Apple iPhone slimmer than Apple II was, or the iPhone II was. And I had a little typo here. They had priced the product 30 40% lower than they could have, you know, comparing the benefits of this product versus what their competitors had done. Um, so it was a lost opportunity. And so here are some things that companies can see how we position in the marketplace, how well do we do when we sign a contract. So a lot of environments, they have signed big contracts, but then there's a lot of celebration, and then nobody's managing those over time. Um, and now switching gears a little bit, going inside the company, you look at... Uh, uh, map your own processes. I'm not talking about big Six Sigma projects or Lean or whatever. If you just doodle on the back of an envelope, how does information flow from your company? So this is a very simple process. The customer sales and pricing, six steps. Uh, the salesperson is talking to the customer. The customer wants a lower price. They have to go to, if it's not in their authority, they have to go to the pricing group and so forth and all the way back to the customer. Simple enough process. Would you think something can go wrong with it? Absolutely. If the customer threatens your salesperson, if you don't give me a lower price now, I'm going to throw you out. Or the salesperson says, I've been in the company 22 years. I don't give a rats whatever. I'll give you a low price now, Mr. Customer. Just buy from me. The entire process is circumvented. Or the sales and pricing people, pricing people don't know what they're looking for. They keep asking for more information. Or salespeople are hiding information. There's back and forth so that causes delays. But when you go do a little more in-depth conversation, you start to do the root cause analysis. Where are things failing? So just between those two steps, we start to get a list of issues that we need to solve. And sometimes they're very simple issues to solve. Now going into more in the data side, here's I threw it. Looks like a gunshot. Uh, uh, this thing, but it's, it's a very simple chart. It's looking at margins and revenues of your customers, if you can do that. And what it's showing is, uh, here is the average margin, average revenues for the customers. When you do that, it gives us some interesting, here are customers who are, give us lower margins and also smaller revenues. And when you look at these, these customers in this, for this company, that was 36% of the customers, and they only brought in 8% of the revenue. Think about it. A lot of times, the salespeople are spending time here trying to get these guys to 
grow the business. Whereas when you look at this section, which has our high priced customers who are buying from us and really are uh, responsible for our bread and butter, we kind of ignore them. We say, okay, they're sending the orders, I need, don't need to worry about them. I just worry about the guy who's the squeaky wheel. So it, it gives us so many aspects, not just pricing. Uh, and of course, you can do more analysis, uh, including statistical analysis. But this analysis, basically it is saying that if there are, you find your internal benchmarks. Even if you don't have a, a lot of competitive intelligence, it, you can see how can two, three, four different salespeople, one is doing very well in the same market environment, but another one is not doing very well. You can start asking those questions. And that creates enough friendly peer pressure Then people say, oh, let me gear my, get my battle gear in shape. Uh, so, uh, and then with those two steps, analysis and with access assess, assessment, we can come with a laundry issue. Like I said, when I was working with a company last year, came up with 60 issues. Now this is a moderated discussion. Get a person in a company who's considered impartial or a senior person who's not saying, you know, I love sales and I hate marketing. Uh, somebody who's considered impartial. And this is not a time of finger pointing. This is saying, okay, we have these issues, we, fix, we need to fix them. Let's look at these issues and ask people to even rate, issue by issue, uh, are we going to go grow revenue with this? Are we, how urgent is this? How quickly are we going to get value out of this? So on a scale of one to five, and once you do that, it's quite interesting, nine times over 10, I, it's about small operational things that needed to be fixed, which gets a lot of money quickly. And while you're doing this exercise, don't leave till you have the milestone set and a roadmap. Of the, we are going to th do these things in a sequence. So at this company, this is from a real company, it was about first defining roles because people didn't know what they were doing. So everybody was trying to make the right thing, trying to do the right thing, but it was either out of their scope of their work or it was in their scope, but they were not doing it. So, so all the way, so you start with the operational things first and you find yourself in a much better situation to now do strategic things, to be really going out and innovating. Um, now we've done that part. The next step is, now this was a small round table, you got things, you know about the issues, you also know about what we should do and how to fix it. It's about training. You really ne need to get a broader group who's going to be involved, people who are affected or involved to be trained. Otherwise what happens is pricing is something that's always very vulnerable to failure and even hostility. You take a price increase, oh, people don't know how to do it well. It's, it's sort of a death nail. Uh, the failures can be big. So it's, it's about really people understanding why the assessment was done, what did we find out from the assessment, what are the recommendations? And from those recommendations, what is needed to be done and what would be the effect of it? And it needs to be explained. And typically you can do that, develop your own playbooks. I borrow this from American football. The coach sits down and says, okay, here's what we know about the other team. Here are things here you're go, going to stand. Here's how you're gonna to pass to the other guy. Think about the same way about your processes. Um, and depending on what's needed, how big is your team doing training and workshops. Um, so this is one way to really implement with certainty <coughs> that you go confidently um, and get things done. So as I summarize, we talked about change. Change is going to happen. And we just need to be prepared for that. Um, and one way is to look at, not look at pricing as just a number, but really go into the root causes and try to fix things. And as you do that, um, get prepared. I lined up four processes, you can do that. And as I was doing that, if you look at the AARTI, uh, when I was doing that, 
I don't know if you know any, you have friends from India, I grew up in India. Arti is, means prayer. So I was looking, I'm not a, much of a religious praying man myself, but in Sanskrit, it comes from two syllables, RT, and it means towards virtue. So in your company, if you can, think about, you know, I'm doing the right thing if I'm going to start launching something like this, and this will prepare you for innovation, and any disruption, heavens forbid, that may be coming towards you. But um, before I end, let me offer you a challenge. Even if there is one thing that resonated with you, go try it in your company. Tomorrow's Friday, start on Monday. So with this, uh, uh, these are some, some of my work. Um, um, if I can answer any questions. What did you say in that moment about saying Kun? Oh, this was the, <laughs> this is the only part I don't uh, read. This was the Chinese edition of the book. <laughs> A lot of things are the same. I mean, actually, in a smaller company, uh, the nice thing is things are not very complex. I've worked with smaller companies, and I find that people are actually more dedicated. There are people wearing more than one hat, so you don't have silos as much. Actually, it's much easier to think, fix things in smaller companies. Issues are real, and people are willing to go work towards. But some of the tools that work in larger companies, bringing them to a smaller company environment, you can just have a huge benefit, probably much faster than you would in a larger company. So I yes. see a lot of your influence is uh, Six Sigma. Six Sigma, I used it in a company. Yes, let me look at this. Also the Lean Yes, so I'm certified in both. I use tools from that. Because in a lot of companies, Six Sigma is, it needs an entire bureaucracy to do it. Lean has an entire flow. And there are companies who cannot afford to spend their time to do a whole Lean project. But taking the tools and applying that in the right place, uh, I certainly do that. Because I've been surprised. Um, uh, so my work, one of the examples I gave you from was the climate control company. I used Six Sigma there. That was the basis of my HBR article. So yes, it works very well in transactional processes, uh, but Six Sigma or Lean are not strategic uh, tools by themselves. There's so many nuances, and it could be industry specific. One thing I see is people wait too long. They launch the best product, but they wait till the 11th hour and, and lose that opportunity to be able to capture value. So I really urge you, if you're in a small business or you're starting a product, Think about their pricing uh, up front and not wait to, uh, till the last minute. All right. All right. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you.